you out, but uh, uh, I was already late, so I apologize for the delay. You back. Um, I hope you had a nice break and a good exercise session where you hopefully have uh, tried to use the union components. Now it's time to continue the session. So we continue with um, a view about what the union components can do if, if you have a bit more experience with them and how to use this uh, in your own uh, exercise. So the first thing to consider is what actually happens when you put these union components in a Maxas instrument file. Well, as normal, the rays go from the source to the next component. We see the components in your instrument file down here. And then they, they scatter inside the component internally and continue. And this is in principle also true for the union components. The ray go into your assembly environment with sample and everything. And then it can scatter around in there for a long time. Uh, until the ray leaves. And then it's handed back to the uh, instrument file and it will propagate it through to the detector, hopefully. But let's take a look at what goes on inside of this master component. Well, here we need to have propagation between all different geometries and so it cannot be linear, it must be a network instead. And if we show this ray with this little karaoke ball, then it would have to transverse these different nodes, which correspond to the different geometries. And it will continue to do so until this little trip has been simulated and then leave. Of course, it would take a long time to check all of these intersections. Each of these lines correspond to a check of intersection for every single step of the neutron. So what is done is that this geometry is analyzed before the actual trace happens, and then the unnecessary connections are removed. So this first outer, it only goes to this one. So we just have one connection. And the network is reduced to something much simpler. Ah. Let me try it. <coughs> the important part is that by... Let's see if it happens again. You might have another crash. By removing these unnecessary connections, we achieve a speed of this code that is sufficiently high to run on a laptop instead of a supercomputer. And this is just something like 10 different geometries. If you have hundreds and hundreds, this becomes a larger and larger factor for the speed of the system. Now, you might have noticed that every time in the terminal after you run the simulation, you get some text like this. And this is actually a, a primitive form of uh, diagnostics helping you understand what occurred in your simulation. And so it numbers the geometries that you have inserted, just incrementing them. So the zero is always the, the surrounding vacuum around everything. And then, for example, my first code uh, is the, the outer layer of the power step then the vacuum, then the inner layer, and the inner vacuum, and then the sample. And then all the histories of array moving to one volume, scattering, moving to the next, are grouped together and sorted. So we see the most frequent one at the top. And what happens here is that it goes from the surrounding volume into the outer layer, into the inner layer, and into the vacuum, into the sample, and then it actually just continues out again. The most probable thing is to just go through everything. 
the neutrons uh, is a weak probe, so this is as expected. The next most probable thing to happen is actually to scatter in the sample. This is this P1, immune scattering process 1, and it happened after or when we were inside volume 5, which is the sample. So this is one scattering event in the sample. And then the others are, are less important. One misses the sample, another one goes through a little aluminium and I have holding the sample up. And here the last one actually just scatters in the outside part of the sample environment. So you can use this to get an idea about where your statistics went when you simulated uh, something with the union component. And it's more or less always output when you use them. Oh yes, here is our only scattering. Now let's try to, to build up a little sample and then look at what kind of results we get. And here we have an uh, instantaneous 5 kilo electron volt beam from a salt symbol hitting our, this is just a simple cylinder, and then we have a banana detector. Over here is the result, we have the time of flight and the scattering angle. And we have the direct beam going through, and then the abrac beam from our single crystal. And this is uh, sodium nickel fluoride, I believe. So, we have this part that's polycrystalline, and we don't see much addition. We have the uh, aluminium rings that hold it to the sample holder, and we get actually some small crack peaks out here at this energy. Then we add the screw that holds it to the goniometer. Nothing much happens. This is out of the direct beam. Then the goniometer itself. Oh, we actually get some delayed scattering. Of course, this is on the rhythmic axis, but still, we see something. We add the base of the sample holder, and more spuriums start to appear. At the experiment, we then decided to uh, encase the little sample holder in boronated aluminium. And actually, it wasn't enough, but we didn't know because we didn't do a simulation beforehand. Then, of course, it goes on the sample stick, and we do see scattering from the sample stick because it just so happens that there's a black peak going more or less straight up in this, and it goes down from the color into the detector. Now we add the inner part of the cryostat. And now the rays need to go through several layers of material and can bounce back and forth in there because there is backscattering in aluminium at these energies. And we see even more delayed scattering and problems. And this is just the inner layer of the cryostat. Now we add the outer layer and we get all of these issues. Of course, this is also a very short time interval. We're only talking about 0.1 or 1 millisecond of time. So it's very close to the elastic line, but it's all sorts of problems that can now be simulated using these union components. And because there's no limits for how long it can scatter around in them, the more you simulate, the longer you get, more and more time delay and lower and lower intensity. Not so weird. But the next step, and also the next step of the exercise, is to understand how to get so ugly. How can you get all the experience? And so, we need to understand where the neutrons scatter. And if we look at our power step from the top, we can add uh, a locker component and then look at the scattering position in the cryostat. Let's look at how you add such a component to your exercise. Well, you need to use the union logger, and now I want to see a two-dimensional image of space, so I see 2D space. Then it's a little different, you need to define your directions. I want the C and the X direction, and then I put a minimum and a maximum, and this is, of course, centered around the position I select with the component. And then 
we just have the resolution of the detector and a file name. And now let's see if we can figure out what goes on over here. In the middle, shining very bright, is our sample. And then this is actually the direct beam coming in and going out here. And then these other parts must be some second or third order scattering. And let's look at that and uh, split into the different scattering orders. And you can do that by saying, uh, I want the order of this monitor, or this locker, to be, for example, one. Then we get the first order scattering. And that can only happen in the direct beam. If you had a uh, number two here, we would look at the second order. And we get some of the power rings from the power fat, and then some of the brack peaks from the single crystal sample. And in the third order, we get a bit of both. And it, it, it continues to many more orders and get more complicated. And you can check this correlation yourself with the lock component. But we also want to understand what goes on in reciprocal space. And that looks really weird. But the, the component is very similar. Now we want to look at 2D Q and scattering vector. And we see Q direction instead of D direction, but very similar syntax. Let's split it up into the scattering orders again in order to see what's going on. Of course, here in the first scattering, we knew the initial velocity or the initial wave vector. So we can only reach this part of reciprocal space. Most of it is uniform. That is actually the incoherent scattering. Then there's one little spot. I don't know if it's visible, but that, that is the, the bracket. And then there's one line here, and the one little line here, that's the two power lines that are available in aluminum at this wavelength. Now, in the second order, the most probable new wave vector is after the Bragg scattering in the single crystal. And that corresponds to this circle. Of course, then you could make a scattering in uh, something other than the single crystal, but uh, powder, and then you would get these powder rings. But they are out of plane, so they become ellipses in this. And in the third order, you can always scatter back again from the same reflection as you did the first scattering. So it goes back to being in the same place. But you could also have taken another path, and then you end up somewhere else in this diagram. We can also animate this by having a logger taking a snapshot in, in specific time frames. So this is the beam, the view from the top. See the beam hits the sample. These are the views from the side. We see the incoherent. And this that's going on now is just really annoying multiple scattering. And it has a surprising amount of structure and even beauty or really ugly if you don't want this as your background. But it shows what we're fighting against and what we want to eliminate from our experiments. And you now are able to simulate it in your exercise. Of course, doing a movie like this takes a lot more computing time and some processing, but you can get the data. Let's try to do some of the more important time together. Again, these are called union loggers, 
and there's a few of them. Um, the one I used for the uh, 2D was 2D space, and then if I want to do a movie, it's called 2D space time. Then it will do a number of time steps that you specify. But you can also have a, a 1D logger that logs as a function of time or some other variable. And you can also have a 3D space logger. It's not a 3D image, it's shown in slices like a time slice would be. But to be honest, this still doesn't get us very far in terms of understanding where this background comes from. If, for example, this thing here is, is what is annoying my measurement, how do I know what part of this chaotic cryostat simulation produced that? Well, there's another kind of component called a conditional component that will help us. It will modify some logger and remove all other events so that only the events that contributed to this little background problem is included in that logger. And here is such an image for this particular um, little background problem. We see that the sample is definitely involved because that has the highest intensity. And perhaps also this rack peak probably. So here is the, the syntax for adding such a conditional. And the important thing is this target logger line where you need to specify the name of a previous union logger. And the rest is like a, a normal monitor. Here we set the, the width and height of the area that it has to hit in order to be included in the previous monitor. And also the time limits. And so you would set this one like a normal PSD. And let's just show it with the logger that it's modifying. So now this logger <coughs> over here will not show all the data, but just the subset that's important to you. And of course, these need to be added before the union master in order for the union master to recognize that these exist. Oh, yeah. This name is what's important for the logger. Now let's play Sherlock Holmes and figure out where this uh, annoying background peak came from. Definitely the first scattering seems to be in the sample. The second is this position, which seems to be probably the mounting plate. And the third one uh, is probably the sample again. But what I don't show here is that the number of neutrons that even make it to the third order is very low, so it's predominantly a second order effect. We can then look at the reciprocal space. We see that, okay, this drag peak certainly is the, the brightest point, but there's also this part of some aluminum rings somewhere that seems to be important for it. Let's look at the scattering orders. Oh, we can't even see it because it's such a tiny point that the resolution of the monitor makes it difficult, but there should be a black peak in here. And then the second order, oh, it's just a small part of a line. And the third order, we have the one little pixel showing the uh, black peak again. We can also animate this. So now we see the same movie as before, but only the rays that contributed to a certain background problem. And there's much less data, of course. So we go in, we hit the sample, and now the rays are traveling down, and at some point they hit the sample here, just at the mounting plate, and then it's black. So what happened was that the rays hit the sample, scattered to the mounting plate, and then to the detector. We can eliminate that by putting shielding over our mounting plate inside the cluster. So, in conclusion, you can use these union components in very complex geometries and you can add modular processes and physics. You can perform full multiple scattering simulations that contain an incredible amount of detail. It is, of course, slower than a typical max test simulation, but still fast enough that you can still use a laptop.
It contains these uh, strong visualization tools that are really important to have any idea about what's going on. They were not there at the very start of this project, and I could only guess at what was actually going on inside of it. So uh, they really can be a great help. And then the last detail I want to emphasize is that it's much easier to contribute new physics to this system because it's modular. So you don't need to consider geometry or the other physical processes. You can add a much smaller piece of code about your interest in physics and then put it on top of a single crystal or incoherent in the user interface. So that's a, a added benefit. And so now for the last exercise in using the union components, you're of course adding these union loggers to your own funny sample environment and then we can see what goes on inside of that. You can also try to add a conditional component if you dare, that's a bit more difficult. And then just before we leave today, I think at around 4, I will have a very short talk about how to simulate a full instrument using these components as uh, that even another level than just simulating the assembly environment. So, around four. And one last thing, there's a solution um, that you can use to, to view how the syntax of all the loggers are. Um, that, that can be a, a good place to look. But of course you can copy those loggers to your own sample environment and use them there as a starting point instead of only um, having to, to find these to contribute components in weird places on your computer. Thank you very much.